as we go through today, you know, again, this is really a, your time to ask questions, um, have a discussion about things, maybe things that came up in the Google Plus community in the last week, or if you have particular questions. Um, I'd ask that we not, I think last week we might have gotten a little bit too deep into the weeds on some very uh, detailed or advanced questions, and I think sometimes those are better handled in some place like the Google Plus community where, uh, you know, we would have time to research it, try things out, and see how it works. But we can also, I'm pretty sure, at least I can, and, and maybe Bridget can hang out towards the end of the meeting um, and answer some of those more advanced questions. But I don't want people who, I don't want it to just go over folks' heads when we talk about some of those more advanced options. Um, Uh, somebody's thanking me for my note encouraging participation even if you're behind. Yeah, I, th I thought I'd try that just to see because I know, at least for me, I get overwhelmed sometimes when I have something like this that's not mandatory. It's just something I want to learn about and uh, the real world starts to overwhelm you and so um, I would encourage everybody to, you know, just keep plugging away. Don't worry about where you are. The resources that we've shared will you know, a lot of them are from Qualtrics themselves. And the Google Plus community, I've been really encouraged by the activity this week and the discussions. I think we've had probably over 10 people share surveys that they've done and everyone's gotten uh, what I think is constructive feedback on that. There's, you know, there's no right or wrong answer necessarily, but uh, people will sometimes offer suggestions that, uh, can, can be helpful. So right now I want to just open it up for questions, uh, discussion, feedback on how things have been going so far, things you think we could do differently, anything like that. Um, I don't want to dominate the discussion so everyone's free to unmute your microphone and speak if you have something to uh, provide back for the group. I appreciate it if everyone doesn't talk at once because it, it really steps on things. Hi, this is Karen Paul, and I just wanted to say that the Qualtrics videos have been great, but I was sort of afraid to delve into them on my own before this learning community because I didn't know what order to watch them in, you know, what were the most relevant. There's There's so much on there, so it's really nice to have these learning sessions guide me into what order to do the things in and you know how to study basically the information that's there. Thank you. Great, thanks Karen. Yeah, I think um, sometimes it's helpful to just know how to get your foot in the door so to speak and, and that's really the hope of this session is that you know, even if you've never used Qualtrics before, that by the time you're done, you at least be comfortable creating a basic survey and, and that sort of thing. And then the Qualtrics University resources will answer most of the questions you might have. Is there anybody that has a particular question about building surveys? I can share my screen and walk through things if you want. Hi, this is Becky Osborne, and I just had a question. Um, one of our folks is, has uh, shared a, sur a survey for oil and gas participants um, in sessions, and one guy who has Windows 10 on his computer was having some problems where the form would not take his responses, and so I 
don't really have access to him, but I gave her some some possibilities. I shared a link from the Qualtrics University, and to me it seems like a browser issue. So you know, I told her that I'm comfortable to work with him if he wants to contact me directly, but she was going to give him some information and then possibly just send him a paper copy. But I was wondering if anyone else had had any issues with Windows 10 um, where data wasn't being accepted. Um, I have not uh, experienced that directly, so I really don't know what to tell you, but I would agree with you that it's most likely to be a browser issue. And, uh, you know, so the one thing you might be able to do is to um, just make sure that the survey itself isn't using any kind of advanced JavaScript, because that's oftentimes a problem. So if it's using some custom JavaScript or custom CSS, if it's just a basic survey um, and it, it works pretty well in the mobile browser, then I'm not sure what to tell you about Windows 10. And even on Windows 10, whether they mean the Edge browser or they're using a different browser on Windows 10. Thank you. Hello, Steve. This is Lynn Harrison. Can you hey, hear me? Lynn. Yeah. Hey, um, when I found that there was a problem with something like that, we had an issue with a survey that wasn't displaying properly. I don't remember the situation. I let Qualtrics know, and they said that they were aware of the issue and that they were working on it. But they are very responsive if you need to give them a call. Um, obviously, I look through the help and all the, that kind of information first. but um, you know, they, they seem to be glad to know that something isn't working as it's supposed to, and they can let you know that they are working on it if they already are aware of it. Well, um, this is Becky again. She had already gotten 30 responses, so we know it was working with a variety of machines, and that's why I kind of was encouraging her to have him contact me because I would kind of like to see what he was experiencing. I mean, there were a lot of things like to empty the cache and check your add-ins and things like that. So I, there was a really good uh, page at Qualtrics that I did forward that link to her to, to forward to him. But I'll tell her that too, that she could share that with, uh, with him and we can get the details to Qualtrics. This is Karen Poff again. Um, just to second the comment about the Qualtrics team's responsiveness, I've called them several times when I needed a certain type of question, like one time I wanted to include dates, but I wanted a drop down menu. And they already have those kinds of questions created, but you don't always know where to find them in their vast resources. So, you know, several times I've called them and just said, I need a question on X, if it was something that was beyond my ability to create. And they will just go into their question bank and find it for you and give it to you. So um, just encouraging people to do call them if you can't figure out how, what you need to do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. They have been responsive any time that I've reached out for them to them for assistance if I couldn't find the answer anywhere else. Um, you know, it's always good to search through Qualtrics University first because sometimes the question's answered in quite a bit of detail, but they're definitely responsive with their support. <laughs> there was a uh, question in the Google Plus community this week um, about or a discussion, I should say, about using open-ended questions at the end of a survey just to give people an opportunity if, if all of your uh, questions were sort of the fixed response, you know, multiple choice or something like that. And so I'm going to just launch a quick poll. And I'd just like to get your feedback. And so the question is generally, do you think you should include 
an open comments question at the end of your survey. Okay, looks like we've had about 80% of the people vote, 86%. I'm going to close the poll in three seconds. Three, two, one. Close the poll. So, based on that poll, 79% of the people said generally they do think you should include an open comments question. And 21% said no. So I think it would be helpful to maybe have a discussion about that. Um, I'd like to hear from people kind of on both sides of the issue and, and maybe we can discuss some of the pros and cons of having that sort of a question. This is John and I think it's um, helpful to include it at the end so that you you might get some information that you hadn't thought about in the survey. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, and for Karen and Sarah who mentioned that I needed a maybe option, I intentionally did not put that because I want people to take a stand. That's why I said generally. If I, one of the things um, maybe we'll, we'll, we may talk about later, I found another interesting thing that, that if folks don't have other questions or things to discuss, I may bring up later. Who, who this thinks is that Becky. You Go ahead, Becky. Oh, sorry, I agree. Um, we, my evaluation was for, for our um, newsletter technology newsletter we send out from our unit and what I find is that sometimes people just need reminded that they have an issue they want to bring forward because they'll reply to that email delivered newsletter and ask or comment about something totally unrelated to the content of that newsletter so I think sometimes people just need an opportunity and that note open field area gives them an opportunity to either praise or complain about something that's been on their mind great is there anybody who said no that is willing to uh, talk about why they said no? Hey, this is Sarah. And I didn't say no. I said yes. But, um, you know, I think uh, the context is really critical here. And if you're really not interested and you're not going to take the time to read it, I agree. Don't ask. Don't ask questions you're not interested in the answer to. But the other mitigating factor is also size. So if you have a survey that you know is going out to thousands of people, you're probably not going to read through thousands of open-ended responses unless you have some amazing grad student money. Um, I think the size of your, you know, your respondent pool is is a critical piece of that as well. But I very much respect if you if it's not if you have very specific information you want and that's all you want, then that's all you should ask. Yeah, I, th I think it's definitely important to keep in mind whenever you're doing a survey or, or anything, don't ask people to give you information if you're not going to use it and you don't need it um, because then you're basically wasting their time. So I think that could definitely apply in this kind of a situation. If you're just not going to pay any attention to it, it's certainly it's not worth having them spend the time typing out an answer and, and then doing it. Um, so up on the screen now, um, this is just a, the post that sort of triggered my thought that this might be a worthwhile discussion. Uh, you know, Ron Drum, who couldn't be here today, but Ron, hopefully you'll watch the recording. Um, had shared a survey and that was one of the comments I made that 
oftentimes I do provide that open-ended thing because um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so he had responded to that, and so we had a bit of a discussion, and it actually triggered me to try and get beyond my personal opinion and go out and see if there was any research <laughs> on whether you should include that type of question. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't find uh, much about that, and that, that may just be because I was rushing through and didn't really hone my, my searching query skills and trying to go through the library database and all of that stuff. Um, but I did find one uh, paper that I linked to in that uh, post of Ron's that's on the Google Plus community where they actually discussed uh, some of the pros and cons of of how of whether you should ask these types of questions. And, and so just to, to point out some of the reasons that they offered that they can be useful is that um, you can do sort of a, you can understand some of the replies to closed questions. It gives people a chance that if you know, for example, I asked you to decide yes or no, um, and we had a couple people who said, well, really, it depends. You should have maybe, and and so sometimes people may use that comment box for that sort of thing. Um, it might give you some additional depth. It might help you identify new issues um, that you hadn't thought of, that you didn't ask about, but for subsequent surveys you might want to use or subsequent research you might want to use. Um, it gives you a chance to get some feedback on the research process and also, you know, again, maybe it triggers that you may need to have some different survey questions in there. Um, and, and some of the main limitations they pointed out is that it, you can't really analyze those very well because they're open-ended. Um, that is very time-consuming. Those are not representative of anything. So even if you have a representative sample of people participating in your survey, only a small portion will typically take advantage or take the opportunity to provide you comments in that open text box. And often it's either it can be critical um, or negative feedback, or it could be very positive feedback, and but that you can't interpret that as being representative of your entire sample. So uh, just wanted to let you know <clears throat> that link is there. You may need to go through your, uh, you know, be on a campus network or go through your library to find it. And, uh, but it, there is an article out there that you might want to look at. Does anybody have any th additional thoughts about that? This is Bridget, and and I would just say that um, I suspect that the the inclination to add an open-ended question at the end of a survey probably comes out of qualitative research methodologies with interviews and focus groups, where it really is considered standard practice. Um, because as an ethnographer or a qualitative researcher, you're you're approaching your participants and the act of doing research itself um, with an understanding that it, it's you don't know all of the things. <laughs> you, you have a certain framework with which you've you know, um, devised your questions, but you can't assume that you know all there is to know about a certain topic or your research question. And so for me, I, I mean, I said yes to that question. I, I think I will, I'm I'm trained that way. I'm inclined to always ask that question, um, but I totally agree with you. I mean, if you're not going to use that information, if you're not going to read through it, if you're not going to um, think about how that might impact future surveys that you might do, then it's probably a waste of your time and a waste of your respondents' time. Thanks, and hopefully you're not too disturbed by these long pauses. I am disturbed by them, but I'm doing my best to not uh, sort of 
jump in and dominate the discussion. I want to give anybody who wants to speak a chance to speak. So if, if suddenly you hear dead air, it's probably not your audio. It's just me trying to give people an opportunity to jump in. Um, so I would welcome any other comments about maybe that particular question or again, if folks have a particular question about doing something in Qualtrics, I would welcome that as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Arlene. Great, great. Okay, my question was I put together a survey and I had somebody who had uh, answered a series of questions and realized they had answered questions that didn't pertain to them where there was an option to leave things blank and wanted to go back to change that. And uh, the Qualtrics survey would not let them go back. So I, I saw there was an opportunity, there was a place where you could, I'm doing air quotes, reset. There was an option through the, the anonymous tagging of uh, survey participants to delete um, survey results. So I had deleted two results um, and I didn't know which person was which, but there were two people who had started and hadn't finished. Is there a way to specifically know who did what survey if I wanted to find out that Mary Jane completed a survey and she wanted to, to kind of reset? Could I reset Mary Jane's survey or could I have reset the partially completed survey so the people could go back and start again? I don't know if you're answering me. I, I hear scratchy sounds like in a horror movie. Somebody come up that way. <laughs> no, I was waiting to see if somebody else wanted to jump in and offer an answer before I before we take a look at some of the options. Okay. This is John. I was thinking there was a way when you set up your survey that you could put um, a back button in there so that they could go back and change their answers. Mm. Oh, back button. Okay. Very good. Very good. I did not click the back button. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes you'll see surveys without back buttons. Um, sometimes that that's for a reason that they don't want people to be able to go back and change an answer based on a subsequent question. Um, I think that really is going to be dependent on, you know, Sarah's favorite answer, it depends. Uh, whether you use that or not is dependent on the particular survey and sort of how long it is. I, I think back buttons can be a good thing. Um, but the way that Qualtrics works, if this was an anonymous survey, um, you wouldn't know who in particular had been filling that out unless you had had a field where you asked for their name, obviously. But um, typically people can sort of, if they come back to your survey and they've already started it, um, Qualtrics remembers it and so that's why when you look at your responses you'll sometimes see partially completed um, people are able to come back and and finish those up and then the other thing is there's a an option called prevent ballot box stuffing <laughs> um, which is is kind of a cute term um, that can be used to try to prevent people from taking the survey more than once um, it relies on cookies and stuff like that. So obviously someone from different computers could take it more than once or with different browsers could take it more than once. But if you have that turned on, then someone, most people would not be able to just come back in and retake the survey. So if you had a reason to, to need to allow people to, to take a survey more than once, like, uh, you know, we have people that use surveys for, um, 
collecting hours, volunteer hours. And so they don't want ballot box stuffing turned on because they want people to be able to, you know, enter their hours every month or every quarter or whatever. Um, but if you wanted to limit it so that people weren't continually uh, entering your survey, you know, for the chance to win great extension gear or something, um, mm -hmm. then you would want to turn ballot box stuffing on. It's, it, okay. I think it's useful to look through these survey options because they um, give you give you the ability to see some of this stuff. For example, this is the partial completion section. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see where I'm, I'm looking at. And it, yes. it basically um, allows you to set how long someone has to come back to the survey. Mm. I think it defaults to a week. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, after a week, it, it deletes their um, response set or their, their individual response. Okay, thank you. Sure. And you had hit on something else that I had as a question. Um, we've we've had some questions about how can we utilize this tool in the field, and I mean literally in a field, cornfield, wheat field, where where we don't necessarily have um, internet access or Wi-Fi in in the region that I'm located in. I'm located in a area with a lot of hills and valleys, and so we have a lot of areas. Um, that there is no internet signal even if you had Wi-Fi or you have uh, data. So the question has been can we you know print out a survey and then can we is there a process of kind of a validated process to upload the data to Qualtrics and and how what would be some strategies to do that? I mean, I was just talking to a colleague the other day about this, um, and I, I don't know too much about it, but evidently, you can pay, of course, <laughs> to uh, pay Qualtrics, and you can, you can actually put your um, survey into an iPad, and you can have folks take the survey offline, and it sort of somehow it, it downloads all of the data and then you can upload it back into Qualtrics later and it tracks all the responses. Um, I, I don't know too much about it. I, like I said, I know he had to pay for it, but um, there is that option if you had some funds for it. I, I think he paid a thousand dollars. Ah, okay. Yeah, this is Steve. There, um, I do have experience with that because uh, UNH, the University of New Hampshire, decided to pay, pay for that option. Mm -hmm. um, basically with Qualtrics, any of these sort of additional options, they have a um, fee that is, it's like $1,000 for an individual to have that capability or $5,000 mm -hmm. for your institution to have that capability for everyone. Oh. That's typical. At least every time I've inquired about one of those options, that's the pricing they gave me. Um, so the university decided to spend the five thousand um, dollars because mm -hmm. there were a number of different groups that that wanted it. So we each chipped in, um, and the way it works is that you create your survey the way you normally would, mm -hmm. um, and you can use it online, so it can be live online, um, and then you in install the Qualtrics application on an iPad. I don't believe it supports anything except an iPad or an iPhone at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to jump through some hoops to put in some special security keys and everything else so you can connect to it. And then you choose your survey that you want to take offline and it loads that survey onto the iPad so that okay. then when you're not connected to the internet, so that's something that has to be done obviously while you are connected to the internet, then when you're not connected to the internet, you can allow people to take that survey. And, and one of the nice things about it is that you, there's a mode called kiosk mode mm -hmm. that basically just, you know, so you can pass the iPad around, someone fills it in and submits it, and it pops up to the survey again for the next person. 
Um, so we've used that uh, on a limited basis for some registrations out at field days or that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, situations where we didn't have internet connectivity. Mm -hmm. And the one thing to note about that is there are certain things that you can't do in the survey um, because they won't translate to, they can't be done in mobile. So there are certain kinds of uh, probably more advanced features, some of the triggers and some of those things that, that won't work uh, when it's offline. And so if you have that, it's going to tell you, you know, we can't load this offline because of blah, blah, blah. And then you have to make changes to the survey. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's good to know. There's, there's been some discussion at Cornell around this and looking at is there is there enough uh, of a need or potential need to, to justify the additional costs. So hopefully somebody will say yes. Yeah, I think that's always the challenge. It's, you know, it's hard to necessarily build all of that justification up front and it's hard to know if it's that useful until mm -hmm. you have access to it. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, so I, will, found... I will tell you that in experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a different way. So, for instance, I think it was used at, um, we had a 4-H alumni event and they wanted people who hadn't registered ahead of time to just mm -hmm. put in their information so we could keep track of it. Well, it started to rain, so they ended up moving inside and the iPad kind of got stuck out you know, stuck aside and people weren't using it and the audience wasn't necessarily used to that idea. Mm -hmm. So they fell back on the, you know, clipboards and people signing in. And then you asked about importing the data. I, there's no, I don't believe there's a good way to import it. Um, you know, you basically need to go from that paper and, and so what we'll have people do is they'll collect it on paper and then someone, a work study or support staff or someone will then enter that into this into the form itself so you can get that data into Qualtrics. Um, but if you didn't need, if you were just using Qualtrics for collection, you could just put it into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, download your results in a spreadsheet and add it directly there. So explain when you when you say download your results into a spreadsheet and add it there. Um, so when you are working with your surveys, um, surveys have results, mm -hmm. right? And so you know, for instance, for this group, when when you completed the survey, um, I have a result set from when it was when you guys completed it. Once mm -hmm. I'm here and I'm looking at my results, I can choose to download the data mm -hmm. in a variety of different formats. So if you're doing research, you may be downloading it into uh, SPS format or something like that. Typically, mm -hmm. I just use the, the CSV. And you have mm -hmm. a bunch of options about you know the date range for the responses, which questions you export, all sorts of things like that. Um, and then you can just download it and you'll end up with a spreadsheet of your data that you can then do something with. So you might use that for importing into another program, for doing a mail merge, for doing all sorts of things like that. Oh, okay, okay. But and you I'll couldn't, you, you couldn't also, upload a spreadsheet into Qualtrics from this end? I have never done that. Has, um, let someone else speak that may have done that in the past. Okay, Sarah says, I don't think so. And Bridget says, I don't think so either. Okay. All well, right, I'm looking for a free backdoor, and I guess the answer is there's not one, Arlene. Yeah, I was just going to comment, comment on the, um, the Excel spreadsheet. I, I use that a lot because I'm not, um, you know, research is not my, uh, pri or my, my job responsibility really, I'm, a, I'm an extension agent, and so um, I'm not as familiar with the statistical packages and things, but when I can get the data in Excel, I can at least manipulate it enough to get some impact results that I can put in reports and things, and it's pretty easy to sort and add and 
those sorts of things to get what you need. Makes sense. Thank you. And I'll give you my free tip of the day is that by default when you go to download a report the zip download is checked and I think um, at least for most of the most of the result sets that I use <laughs> are not that big so compressing them and then having a zip file that I then need to unzip to get the Excel file out of is not that useful so I always come in and uncheck the zip download so that's my free tip of the day Okay, thank you. Unless, of course, someone wants to send me a quarter for it. But I'm assuming its value is somewhere near free. Hey, Steve, I was just thinking that um, looking at the screen you're on right now um, and going back to Arlene's question a few minutes ago about how to, um, well, potentially delete responses and let someone take the survey again. Yeah, I thought you might show her if you click on that responses tab. Um, you know, if you know that, that a few people have taken a survey as a test on a certain day, you can you see all the responses there and you can just click that little checkbox on the left if you know, for example, that your survey was going live on a certain day and you had 10 people test it a few days ahead of time and you can get rid of those answers. You can just delete them there. Or you can do what Steve was showing us, which is you can export the answers from a certain date on so that you're only getting answers to your survey from the people who you wanted to actually take it rather than just test it. That's back in the download data section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the other things, and, and this isn't necessarily what we're, we were going to talk about today, but in the um, survey options, you can actually sort of bucket your results, if you will. So when I'm looking at a survey, um, when I go to survey options, um, there's a response set. And so I can say new responses go into. So for example, in this particular case, I had a default response set. We used this uh, survey in 2014, I believe it was, for, the, for one of the original groups we used for, for this. Um, and so that had a whole bunch of responses in it. And so what I did when we opened up the registration for this learning session was I created a new response set. I just called it 2016 so that all of the new new respondents would go into a separate response set and so then I see that when I come over to de -de 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 viewing my results um, when I look at um, say a report I have different reports that use different response sets Wow, that was 2013 that we did the first one, Sarah. You must be getting old. <laughs> we were ahead of our time, Steve. <laughs> that's how I'm going to think of it. So anyway, that's another thing that you can do if you wanted to, you know, separate out. Maybe you're using the same survey for uh, workshops that are spread out over a few months, but you want to use the same survey, you could separate them out by response sets ahead of time. It can just make it a little bit easier to work with things if you want to do that. So um, I just have a question about that. The advantage of that would be that you could put the whole set back together. Because, like, I, I just use folders to copy the survey for another year. But it sounds like you doing it this way, I would be able to pull the whole set for multiple years if I wanted to. Is that right? Yes. Um, let's see. D, D. Trying to see. 
I'm just trying to see where I know. I think you have to change the response set first. It's being a little slow maybe because I'm on go to train as well. So this has 76 and I would, I would have to look at a little bit more. I'm, I have part of my screen hidden with the go-to training. Um, there, I believe there is a way to choose the um, response set um, that you're actually choosing to download, as well as as view in the report, so you can combine them if you need to. But I just find it a, a kind of a clean way. I don't want to dump my old data, but I want to. Um, you know, just make it easier for me to work with the new data. And I'm sure that there is a Qualtrics article on working with response sets, so it would be a good place to look. Folks have other questions, comments, things for discussion? I'm going to take a look at the chat and wait for someone else to speak. So Lynn, there there are ways with um, with reporting that that we can aggregate some of that. If you if you're sending out sort of to a panel, so you can actually you know identify who each person is. There's a way to aggregate that data. Um, I'll I'll take a look around and see if I can find a good example of that and share it on the Google Plus community. I'm going to do one more poll just because I found this today and uh, it kind of baffled me. So my question is, are you familiar with the term satisficing? And don't go look at Wikipedia. Okay, so it looks like we might have had two people who said yes. So is are either of those two people willing to tell the group what satisficing is? All right, I don't blame you for not stepping up. Um, does anybody who doesn't know what satisficing means want to explain what it is? No, I assume not. Um, so satisficing, and and I've 
just really encountered this term and read about this morning, so my, my explanation may not be as articulate as it should be. Um, but it basically has to do with the idea that um, people may try to get through your survey, not necessarily you know, in our idealized world, when we send out a survey, people look at it, they read it, they think about the answers to the questions, they try and choose the most accurate answer, and um, we get this imaginary pool of clean data that, um, you know, has, has the result of thoughtful responses. Satisficing um, can be caused by a number of different things, but um, it basically results in people just trying to give you an answer to satisfy you um, as the sort of survey giver. So there, there are some articles. I, I recommend you search uh, for it. There's some Qualtrics articles. There's some articles out you know, if you want to go out into the research world, there's, there are research papers on satisficing um, and what may cause it. And I think it really gets back to sort of the, the principles uh, of survey design and conducting surveys that uh, Sarah and Mike Lambert talked about in the, that approximately one hour video that we shared with you right at the beginning of this, um, you know, starting this session. And you know, you can think about it in terms of if your questions are not good, um, if they're confusing to the reader, there's a mental process that the respondent has to go through to respond to a question. First, they have to read and understand the question. Then they need to uh, think about that in their own context and try and come up with a, you know, the accurate answer. Um, and then if it's an open-ended question, they need to articulate that in writing or they need to make a choice. So that assumes that you gave them the appropriate choices to choose from. And they, so it can be influenced by frustration. They can be frustrated with the wording of the question. You know, some people get frustrated if you leave a comma out of a sentence or if the font changes from question to question. Um, they may be frustrated and say, well, if they didn't spend the time to really make sure this survey was, was perfect, then I don't have to worry about uh, answering it perfectly either. Um, I saw an interesting article that talked about the use of sort of the matrix questions. I don't know if you've seen those. They're sort of the tabular format questions where, you, you know, you'll say, how much do you like? And then you'll have a list of items, say peanut butter, jelly, uh, Brussels sprouts, and for each row, they'll have, um, you know, options. And so it lo looks like a table. And one of the dangers of that um, is that people will sometimes just do what they call a straight line response, where they just click the same box down the entire row. They don't actually take the time to read the question. And so that, that could be uh, a reason why they want to split questions up or ask fewer questions. Again, getting back to that, um, you know, only ask what you really need. Um, Bridget's sick of taking the same survey over and over. Someone else mentioned the survey being too long. I know for myself, I have started surveys with very good intent to provide the most accurate uh, answers that I could. And by the time I got to the 95th page, I was just trying to get done because I wanted to just find a submit button. So um, does anybody have any thoughts about maybe some of the things about surveys that could lead to satisficing or questions uh, about what satisficing might be? I'll, I'll make a comment, and um, I think, Karen, I was laughing at your comment <laughs> because I know that Karen uh, is a regular attendee in, in many of our uh, Military Families Learning Network webinars, and we 
we evaluate every webinar that we um, put on and we do that because <clears throat> partly just out of good practice because we want to make sure that we're offering quality experiences um, but also because a lot of the granting organizations that we um, have an agreement with to offer continuing education units through require that we evaluate every webinar in which we offer these CEUs and so I am 100% positive that um, many of our participants are satisficing um, and going through our webinar evaluations and just click, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, because they just want to get the CEUs. And I don't blame them. Um, but I think, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a problem that we're constantly having to deal with and we try to change the evaluation surveys here and there, but um, the bottom line is that, you know, if you're a regular attendee, you, you've seen those surveys all the time, and I and I can't, <laughs> I wish we didn't have to ask you to take them, but, but we do. So that's sort of a problem that we're constantly having to juggle. Oh, thanks, Karen. We try to, we do try to keep them short, at least. Um, I saw a couple people asked about posting links, and I will. I'll post something in the Google Plus community about satisficing and, and provide a few links. Um, one thing I'll, I'll probably I'll try and find some links that are kind <clears throat> of open because those are often easier to get to. But I may also post a couple uh, sort of more research paper links. And again, the only caveat with those is that you may need to be connected to your university network, and then if your library doesn't subscribe to the journal, and yada, 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 all more reason why all research should just be open source so that people can actually read it, because it's not that valuable if people can't read it, but that's my soapbox. Um, another question I had, and maybe Bridget, you could speak to this, uh, there was some discussion in the Google Plus community over sort of the demographic, uh, asking for demographic information, and I was doing some reading about that as well, and, um, you know, an interesting point was whether that demographic information should be asked for up front or at the end of the survey. Um, and I know that many people in Extension have to ask for that demographic information because of um, civil rights reasons and, and just to sort of know who their audience is when they are talking to stakeholders. Um, and so the arguments I saw was that putting that information at the end of the survey may be better because when you ask for it right up front, um, it can do a couple things, but one is it can kind of make people not want to do the survey at all because they feel that that information is more personal, whereas by the time they've sort of done the survey and they, they get a sense of, you know, what it's, why you're asking the questions you are and the kinds of questions, then they may not uh, feel the same way about providing that information. Do you have any, does anybody on here, has you given that much thought or uh, read anything about what might be best practice in that regard? Steve, I think typically the best practice is demographics at the end. I, th I think the other critical piece of that is whether or not it's really information that you need. Yeah, that golden rule again, don't ask for it if you don't need it. Have the other folks uh, asked for demographic information in surveys? And if so, did you put it at the beginning, the end, the middle, spread it all throughout? Hey Steve, this is Sergio um, with Oregon State University and I, I went ahead and 
put it at the the back of the or toward the end of the survey as well. I got some feedback with some surveys that I initially um, you know produced, and it's always kind of hey put this toward the end because at the very least, well the surveys that I filled out or that I constructed, um, I was really going. Um, I wanted them to answer several questions first, and um, I guess the demographics were important, but at the same time, um, I, if I can get some information, if they're willing to at least give me the information that I need, um, I didn't necessarily have to correlate that with demographics, but it would have been nice, so I went ahead and put it toward the end, and that's what I continue to do um, in my surveys. Great. Cindy, do you want to talk about why you put it at the beginning? Um, basically because I found that if I do put it at the end, then they don't complete the survey. Whereas if you put it at the beginning, they know that it's um, on there. Yeah, that's a good point. I also know that oftentimes marketers ask for that demographic information, um, not necessarily just to market to you more, but because they're trying to ensure that they have a representative sample. And so, um, you know, for instance, if I was doing a, a survey across the state of New Hampshire about attitudes towards extension, um, I might ask for at least some general demographic information so that I could um, determine whether my the sample that I got was representative of the population as a whole. Um, again, you, as with all things, you have problems with whether people answer truthfully and that sort of thing. But that's that's one reason why people might include demographic information besides sort of the civil rights requirements within extension. Great, we're coming up on the top of the hour, just about a minute. Um, I want to give anybody an opportunity to ask a question that hasn't had the opportunity already. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I'll stay on the line for a little bit if you have sort of a more in-depth or advanced question that you didn't want to share with the entire group or you just felt you know people might not care about as much as you do. Um, I'll stick around and, and we can you know, take a look at it on my screen and have a discussion. Anybody else is welcome to stay if they want, but uh, I want to be respectful of your time and recognize that you have invested with us today. Um, that's a benefit to everybody within the group. I've been really um, happy with the amount of participation we've had both here in the in the live sessions, but also within the Google Plus community. And I would just encourage you to, to visit that, take a look at some of the discussions, provide your feedback there. Um, I'll post, uh, I'll put a post in there about uh, satisficing, and maybe we can have a further discussion about that within uh, Google+. So thanks, everybody, for your time. Um, if you have another question and you want to stick around, please feel free to do so. But I'm going to stop the recording now. And if you don't stick around, um, we'll see you next week.